Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Um, kind of kind of shifting gears a little bit here. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the way that that you hunt mule deer, which I think is super interesting. And you you seem to find specific deer, at least from the outside looking in. You find specific deer, and you try to hunt them and go after these deer. And and when when I was talking to you at Total Archery Challenge, just like some of the things that you were talking about, and I've heard you on other podcasts and stuff like talking. I was like, there's so much there's such a uh, correlation to the way that, that I hunt whitetails, even though, I mean, a little bit different approach, but the same kind of style and work that you put into that is, is incredible. And I don't know if it would be best to kind of just have, like you talk about, um, talk about kind of your approach is the way you look at it or from a, you know, a story of a specific buck. I, I'll kind of leave that up to you to think how you would describe kind of your approach there. Yeah, so I, I do, specifically on mule deer, and mostly, um, for whatever reason, the units that I, I tend to be really picky here in Utah. I tend to be picky on my Arizona hunt, um, and those are the two that I'm, I'm actually pretty picky. For one, uh, both those places have potential to produce really big deer. Um, it's extremely difficult. So I'm talking OTC, right? Cause I'm the world's worst person at drawing tags. I've literally only ever drawn one control tag and I spent seven points on a three point yeah. unit. So everything else that I do is OTC or general, um, no points, no, that sort of thing. So my deer hunt, I do every year, you know, I've, I've, uh, um, the, the unit has a crazy amount of pressure here in Utah. I just deal with it. I figured out different tactics that work for me and that's the hunt that I do. It's in my backyard. I can spend an ultra amount of time. And then the same in Arizona. It's it's fairly close. Um, and if you're willing to put in the work and you and you learn some things, there's some some big buck potential down there on on the OTC tags. Um, but that again, that's not for the faint of heart. Uh, there's more area to spread out, so you don't feel the pressure near as much as the front. But I mean, you got to glass 30 square miles to turn up six deer in some of those deep desert areas. So it's just, it's just, just unique in a challenge, challenging. Um, so first of all, you have to kind of, for me, I have to identify a unit. Um, am I going to be ultra picky in a unit that I know isn't going to produce, let's just call it 190 inch, 200 inch type deer? Well, well no, cause you, you, you got, you, you, for one, the unit has to be able to produce that, that type of deer, right? So if you're trying to hold out for a certain size buck in a unit that's not capable or very remotely capable, low percent chance of producing a buck like that, you're, you're kicking yourself. So, um, you kind of have to have a rolling standard versus the, uh, compared to the hunts that you do. So, and, and that's, and that's my approach. So here on the front, I am ultra, ultra picky. It's in my backyard. I've got four, let's see. Yeah, essentially three and a half months to hunt. Um, uh, plus, plus on top of that, I've got two months during the summer to scout three day, three or four days a week. Um, so I've got the time to put into it. I've got a job that allows me to be away in the mornings. Um, I've got a very understanding wife that, understands my fixation on hunting and it makes me a better father husband um uh she knows that a happier you you hear happier happy wife happy life or whatever it's well happy husband happy in her mind right so um (laughs) i do spend a ton we're going backpack we're taking our seven-year-old and our four-year-old backpacking this weekend so i i'm i i do a ton of family stuff too so i don't want to sound like i just you're not just family, a shit bag father. But, I got it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, yeah. Well, sometimes during hunting season, I feel that way. When I was chasing a buck that I killed, um, pretty good buck. I killed, uh, a few years ago. I call KK. Um, it was a late, late November hunt. And, uh, anyway, I spent 
probably too much time obsessing and hunting that deer and probably strained the family life a little bit, but it was very, very specific deer. And, uh, um, I think my wife was very understanding. I, I spend an ungodly amount of time hunting that deer. So, um, anyway, but, uh, so my tactic is, is, is you go out there, you scout up. I don't have the opportunity to scout in Arizona, but, um so you go out there and you 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 find you find a buck you find a buck or a couple of bucks that are really intriguing to you the type of bucks that are going to allow you to despite all of the crap the pressure the the fatigue um uh you know wake getting four hours of sleep like i was joking with my buddies that this week sunday night monday night and tuesday night because i i i glassed Monday morning, Tuesday morning, and Wednesday morning. So the three nights previous, I got four hours of sleep. Uh, th- three nights back to back. Four hours of sleep, four hours of sleep, four hours of sleep. You've got to find a deer that motivates you enough to be to want to do that, right? So it's like this obsessive thing. So th- this is just me, and this is just how I, how I work. If I can find the cape, if I can find that quality of deer. It, it's something that I'm willing to sink my time into. So that's a really important thing. And that's going to vary. That's gonna, It varies for me, right? Like the particular deer called KK, he was just a really big deer. But then there's been other deer that have intrigued me because they, they're they really old or they're very unique. Or honestly, this year, if I find a really, really big typical four point, like 180, 100, you know, 100, I'd be pretty hard to pass up a perfectly symmetrical 180 inch four point i've killed several deer that score better than 180 inches so a lot of people ask well why wouldn't you hold out for anything better well because i don't have a perfect 100 you know 80 plus inch four point on my wall and it's a gap i want to fill so it's kind of you got to find you got to find something that you're willing to obsess over that's the most that's the most important part to this this sort of hunting then just day in and day out, you're going to go hunt that deer. You don't give up hunting that deer. You don't, you don't, you don't think, well, maybe this other, until you know that that deer has either been killed or, or maybe is for sure gone. Maybe you've gone two weeks and you haven't seen the deer, then, you know, maybe you're going to change something, but it's your ultra, ultra obsessive. You find him scouting, um, and then you spend every waking moment on the mountain hunting that deer. In my particular case, I've got to use alternate methods because for the most part, where I found those big deer, you can't spot and stalk them. So I utilize uh, ambush hunting. Um, I've hunted bucks out of tree stands, ambush, um, pinch points, um, uh, light light bumps, light, light, light wind bumps. You and I talked about that a little bit. Um, And so a lot of that comes in it. So here on the front, I kind of, I scout, I have two terms. I say macro, I macro scout. So I take big optics, uh, BTX 115, ATX 115. And I've got these strategic glassing points where I can see into multiple basins. And then I, I identify frames and then I move in and get a closer look. I've been doing that for 10 years. Um, so I'm, I'm not the guy that's got, the cleanest best phone scope of every deer right because i'm glassing them from three miles away but i know with just how busy i am i can't go micro glass every individual basin right i've got to figure thing i've got to i just got to figure it out because i can't be on the mountain every day so so once i find that deer i go and make sure that's the one and then i and then i'm i'm focused on it i'm i know his route so what I try to optimize is the number of opportunities. And when I say opportunities, then and for, for me on the Wasatch front, I found that it's just a morning gig. The evenings kind of suck. So I want to optimize the number of mornings that I'm in position on that deer. Um, so that's where with my job on the front, being able to be up there the most mornings that I can is very effective. So it's very much like this. You figure out where they're living. You kind of figure out his pattern. But here on the front also, there's so much pressure that after the opening weekend, the pattern kind of shifts because of all the pressure. So, but 
you're still putting yourself in that in that position. You're still you're still up there. Um, and you know, have, having a buddy that can come up and help glass for you once you find him, or or come lightly bump him. Um, that that stuff speaks volumes. But it's this war of attrition for me on these deer um, that I've killed because. Again, I can't, I can't, very rarely will I spot a deer, put it to bed and stalk him. For one, that literally just doesn't happen very much because of our terrain and our thickness. And then also because of the hunting pressure. Um, similar to Arizona, where, where I can't, where I can't quite do this war of attrition in Arizona, um, I start out on the biggest, gnarliest peak and I pull out the big glass and I'm looking for, for, and this is a rut hunt, right? So I'm just looking yep. for deer and then, oh, there's a bunch of deer over there. Then I'll, then I'll kind of point hop over to that, that better spot. And then I'll kind of hone in. So two deer. So I've killed a number of pretty good deer. Um, the one, that one, he doesn't look giant from below, but that's 170 inch three point. <laughs> um, and it's a, it's, and it's a desert deer. Um, that's a, that's a yeah. big three point. Um, that's probably my second, no, not probably. That's my second favorite buck because of just the amount of time. And I've killed a four, four or five bucks to score be- better than him. But, um, that deer just, it's kind of, so it was Arizona out of state. Uh, we were grinding for the first six days of the hunt and we found him and then we, we focused into the, much gratitude to my friend. Um, uh, he let me continue to stock this deer, even though we were swapping days on stocks. And anyway, so after three or four days of hunting that deer, finally got him killed. But it was the same thing, like macro glassing, um, finally found him, turned micro, and then just war of attrition, just trying to be, in this particular case, and I find it happen a lot on the rut, once once deer kind of group up in the rut, they start behaving more like elk. That lead doe will feed with her with her nose into the wind, um, kind of more on rutting grounds, right? It's not so much big mountain country. There, it's more just thermals, but rut-type hunts, they'll behave like elk. They'll feed into the wind. So it's really hard. It can be really hard to stock in on a bedded buck because he's probably surrounded by does. And... If think, so think about this. So if you're stocking in on a group of deer, um, and, and you're waiting for them to stand up, right? Maybe you can't get a shot in his bed. Um, you're, you're coming at it basically if they're facing into the wind. So you're coming at his butt, right? Well, if they get up to move and they're going to feed into the wind, they're going to get up and feed straight away from you. You know how many times I've heard that I was in position 40 yards from the deer, but he stood up and just fed straight away. Well, he's feeding into the wind with the deer, right? So um, you're better off, if you can't shoot the buck in his bed, you're better off to get 90 degrees to him and wait for him there because the group's going to feed into the wind. And then you do it just like, it's classic elk hunting, not calling type situation. You kind of dog that herd until he's on the periphery and then you got to be close enough that you can take advantage of that opportunity. And that's how I killed this deer after four days of doing it. So it's just this, this war of attrition that sooner or later, they're going to make a mistake, but you need to be in position for that lucky opportunity to happen. So that for the most part, that's why I've killed all of my really good animals with the exception of one. I've got like 190 inch, a white tail frame three by four. I killed the second day of the hunt. We did a we did a little bump and he pushed on an escape route that I had seen him on. In fact, it was the same trail that I glassed him up on that morning. I was in position, made a really good shot, and shout out to my good friend Ty Glenn. He helped me kill that deer. Um as he has helped me kill several <laughs> deer and anyway. But um but yeah, the war of attrition. So does that kind of 
No, no, that's no, it's it's good. And and I like I like how you explain the macro and the micro, because like I can relate that again, going back to whitetail, just because that's what I'm familiar with. But like so for for us here, you know, in the east and the Appalachian Mountains, you can't you can't really glass or be able to see. So I'll do a lot of times with cameras like I'll go to these different areas that look good from a map, have the, the vegetation diversity and cover I'm looking for. And I'll start throwing cameras in these different spots, you know, maybe just a few out. And then once I collect that data, it's like, okay, here's a buck worth going after or something I want to go. And now I'm going to start putting more cameras in there and maybe start, you know, looking and trying to identify tracks in different spots and trying to really start honing Mm -hmm. in on those spots versus, you know, just either going all in on one spot, uh, you know, from the beginning or just like kind of starting broad and then narrowing it down as it goes. And narrow down. That's my scouting approach. And even if I'm in a unit that I'm not scouting, that's my hunting approach. So that, that's Arizona, right? Like I go down there with very limited time. So Brody, Brody's the customer service manager for Western Hunter. I love Brody. He's a great guy. Uh, he picked me up from the airport in our Arizona hunt this year. And we had five days. And in five days, so I killed that buck in 2022. Okay. So 2023, so a few a few months ago, so January of this year. Went down there for five days. Same thing. Uh, started out glassing like thirty square mile, you know, thirty square miles from one giant peak, and then kind of just hopped and and honed in on 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 our spot. And we hunted, and I stalked and almost killed. Was within was within a hundred yards. Uh, a different buck had come through and kind of busted up the herd, and they escaped out of the saddle before I get a shot. But I hunted a 193 inch four point. He was killed by a local whose dad actually had sent an arrow through no man's land on the buck and the buck survived. Anyway, come January, the son was able to start hunting. And while I was there, I didn't know it, but we continued to hunt that buck for three more days. And, um, uh, the last day he was already actually already dead, but I didn't find out to the end of the hunt, but, kind of the same thing um you just start out really macro uh and then identify what you're going to do and then um so a lot of times that that's really important right so you can arizona you can actually do some spot and stocking um from a from a terrain perspective because you can you don't you you may lose them for a second but for the most part you don't lose them completely like our forest here so you can stock in on a deer that's bedded the problem with that is, is oftentimes they're surrounded by does and, and so you, you can't get in. And in that situation, if you can't shoot him in his bed, I kind of like to get that 90 degrees to him. Uh, maybe, maybe just, maybe just into the wind a little bit, 90 degrees so that you can be in a better position when he stands up or, and, and then feeds towards you, right? Not feeds towards you, but feeds, you know, you're kind of doing he's going this way and you're, you're yeah. doing this way. You're yeah. Kind of an angle trying to run into him essentially. Yeah. And, and you know, and it's like, I like how, I like the other part you said about, you know, just the, the, the persistence aspect of it. Like, you know, when last year um, I was hunting elk in Montana and I found this big bull and I, and I'm not someone that was chasing well, I was, I was trying to shoot a good bull cause I'd shot, you know, a, a, you know, a raghorn essentially my first bull. And I was like, all right, I want to shoot, shoot a bigger bull. And, and, and I, then I found this herd bull that was just like incredible. And I dedicated my hunt to, to going after him. And it took 14 days before I had my opportunity. And it was, is exactly what you said you where it was like, I was doing the same thing every day and I just was waiting for him to do something stupid and me get lucky as far as, you know, pushing the cow squirted out of the group and, you know, came there. And, but during the hunt, I was so, I was so in my head as far as like, I felt like I didn't know what I was doing. You know, you're, you're there and you're like, I'm like, I don't know. Usually I'm just trying to find elk. And at this point I was like, I'd found them and I was, you know, they'd go and they'd bed and they the herd bull would bed on this knob and he had cows around him. And then he had satellites on the outside. And it was like, I'd chase him up the mountain in the morning, you know, trying that, that tactic and, and doing it. Yep. And then they go bed and then I'd kind of just sit on them. And, you know, I tried a couple of times getting close and being aggressive and he just, he didn't carry at all the cows in the world with him. So it was like, then I'd wait for the evening and try to anticipate where he was going 
and play the wind and the thermals and try to get just on the side of them. And like, for me, it was, I didn't have much experience with it, but it felt like the right thing to do at that, that time. And I was talking to, um, I was talking to Corey Jacobson at TAC about it. And I was like, you know, explain, I was like, how do you, you know, do that? How do you get close to some of these bulls or like when you find them like that, he's like, sounds like you're doing the right thing. It's just, it takes the time to, to be able to, to do it sometimes. Yeah, just the, the the there's always going to be a, a luck aspect, right, to hunting because it's it's a it's a wild animal, but the, you got to put yourself in the position for luck to happen yeah. to you, and that's just the story of my life. And um, you go and listen to podcasts with a guy, you know, I respect the hell out of like Tony Treach. Um, he's a uh, I, he's constantly talking about this as well, putting your time in so that you can. So, so that when the right opportunity happens, you can capitalize on it. And that's, that is just exactly how things have happened for me with, you know, my, 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 my big animals. And, uh, so you got it, like I said, you got to, you got to be somewhat obsessive. You got to find a deer or an elk that motivates you to, to just, despite all the shit. And I can tell you 14 days, two months you know, when you're doing the same thing, you know, that's the definition of insanity, yeah. right? It's doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome. Well, that's how you kill big animals. You, you, you become insane because you're doing the definition of insanity, but that's how you do it. And the difference is, is eventually that animal is going to screw up and you got to be there to capitalize on it. I remember Brian Barney is another guy I respect. Yeah. He killed a really big bull a couple, the same year that I killed my big buck, the uh, KK. And I remember Brian saying something, um, in a podcast or maybe, maybe, maybe mentioned something on an Instagram post that like he just day in and day out, he was just dogging it, dogging it, dogging it, dogging it. And finally he made a mistake and he killed it. And, and at the time I was hunting KK and I just, I, I, I kind of just used that as a moment. Like I just need to stick with it, stick with it, stick with it. And eventually well, it turns out this particular buck, he, he was just nocturnal and he just stayed in this thick forest. Like it was a kind of mule deer behaved very, very uncharacteristically for mule deer. Anyway, I ended up having to wait till the rut before he even like came out into the daylight, if you will. He was like, maybe he's real. Maybe he, maybe he identified as a albino deer and he just didn't want to be in the sun from health. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I, but that deer just did not like the sun and just stayed in the forest until the rut, until the, until the, until he was uh, booty blinded by the does. But anyway, you got to be motivated on the animal. Um, so if you're going to pick something like this, if you're going to, if you're, you're going to trophy hunt or selective hunt, you got to find something that you're motivated on, because I can tell you what, you're going to break down. And you got to be okay with eating tag soup. Um, that's something that bugged the crap out of me a long time ago. And it doesn't bug me anymore. I mean, repetitive tag soup starts <laughs> to bug me, but, but like the Wasatch front tag soup, where I know I'm just pursuing the biggest buck I can find all summer, that, that tag soup doesn't bug me. Now tag soup all season long. Yeah. That starts to bug me. Like not every hunt that I do is oriented to that trophy style hunting, right? Like I'm going to, I know that I'm going to bow hunt 50 days on the front this year. And I know I'm going to be exact, just dead exhausted by the end of the hunt. So when I kind of do my out of state hunts, I've actually, I actually joked with my buddy when I killed this deer, which, uh, for a desert three point 170 inches, he's, he's a, he's a big ass trophy in my mind. I actually told my buddy, I was like, man, I really hope that we don't find a really nice, definably big mule deer because I just kind of want to have fun on this hunt. <laughs> and, you know, four days into the hunt, we find him and I'm like, oh, F, I got to yeah. hunt him. Because I, I don't think every hunt can be that way, right? There's still some, there's still some fun and adventure to just buck hunting or bull hunting. So I don't get overly serious on all my hunts. Like, I'll start out being pretty serious on the front. Uh, I'll be serious the whole time on the front, but I'm going to hunt muzzleloader to Colorado. Not going to be too, not going to be uh, too picky there. 
I've got an Idaho tag. And the funny thing is, is everybody in the industry just thinks that bow hunting is the hardest and, and bow, you know, bow only bow, yada, yada, yada. You want to hunt the hunts that kick my butt more than any hunt is general season, Utah and Idaho rifle hunts. I can, for the life of me, not kill a nice 175 inch plus buck on either of those hunts. Now I haven't hunted general season Utah rifle forever, but I try to get up to Idaho as frequently as I can for their general rifle hunt. And that's a hard hunt. So everyone that thinks that, that bow hunting is so hard and rifle hunting kicks my ass. <laughs> like I can, I can bow hunt in August and September and November, and you're seeing these big deer and you can be motivated. Well, if you're, you know, I've killed a lot of deer, so I, and I'm fine with eating tag soup. And I'm not saying that every deer needs to be 190 inches, but if I want to go kill 175 inch deer in Idaho, I'll probably set my sight. I'm going to set my sights on that and probably stick with it. 175 inches, I think is accomplishable in the units that I want to hunt, but holy hell, it can be hard to find that deer on that hunt. And so a lot of me, like as much as I love bow hunting and, and, and I, I just eat, drink and breathe shooting my bow and tuning my bow and fiddling with it. I love open sight muzzleloader hunting and I love rifle hunting. And I kind of, I kind of, I kind of just not necessarily that we fight or quabble amongst ourselves, but like there's a lot of aspects of, of rifle hunting that are harder than bow hunting and aspects of bow hunting that are harder than rifle hunting. And, and, you know, it's just, I don't even know why I'm on this, but it's, I think it's important to realize that we're all hunters. We all deal with, we all deal with issues. My, my biggest thing, like, I don't really care the weapon that you kill it with. I per the, now this personal, but what I personally want to know when somebody kills something, I know that a lot of people will, oh, he killed that with a rifle. I'm going to discount that completely in my mind. That's not how I roll. I want to know if he killed it on public land and if he killed it on kind of like a, um, like a high, a high, a high end tag or, or, uh, you know, um, there's just such a disparity between the general season type stuff and the limited entry type stuff. Two things I want to know when somebody kills something is was it public land and what type of tag was it? Not what weapon was it? What, uh, not to say that I have a problem with guys buying tags or anything like that. It's just, if you, if you want to get an idea of how, what you can set your sights on, right? Cause if everyone's hunting general season, you can't go and set your sights on somebody who's hunting the Alton ranch every year, right? Like that's not realistic. So it's not like a comparison thing. It's just, well, I guess it is a comparison thing, but it's not like a competing with a person. It's just what is realistic attainable goals? Yeah. Right? Realistic attainable for what, what you're hunting and what you're doing. You know, that's, right. you know, we, we, I think you and I talked about it a little bit um, when we were attacked, but like, that's why I said, like, I love hunting Pennsylvania so much for whitetails and everyone's like, well, that, that's crazy. You know, there's not the biggest deer in the world there or anything, but it's like, yeah. this is a place that I can scout. I can do my work, go all in. And, you know, if I shoot 130 inch whitetail, that's six years old. Like, that's awesome. That's, you know, that, that, that's yeah, that's, that's yeah. incredible. And, you know, I would compare it to, to shooting, you know, a bit, a bigger buck in a state that has more of them. And I'm, and not discounting yeah. that state. It's just like, I, I, I just look at every, every place I go and every experience a little bit different, you know, and what I want out of it and being able to, to do it. And, and it's just, I, I think that's kind of fun and everyone's got their different goals and what they want out of it. Yeah, ex exactly. I'm glad you said that. Um, cause that, that's the sort of thing that I'm, I'm referring to you, you. We get obliterated with social media and we see the good side of everybody and the highlights, uh, kind of f funny thing that you mentioned that. Cause it reminded me of a guy that I have mad respect for his name, Steve Evans. He's mostly a rifle hunter. He lives in California. Um, and last year he killed, um, so unless you're like on the far East side of California, you're hunting, um, black tail mule deer hybrids. They don't get that big. Um, he killed like 173 inch 
blacktail mule deer hybrid last year on the opening day of their rifle hunt. And people just got an, I, he posted something on Instagram and it was just like, people think it's just a mule deer and yeah, it's a good buck, right? It's a good buck, good rifle buck. Well, what the people don't know is like, no, that is a California blacktail mule deer hybrid. And that is like the equivalent of killing a 210 inch buck in Nevada or Utah or Colorado or Wyoming. And so you, you can't just look at social media and be like, well, this dude always kills 200 inch deer. Well, guess what? He's hunting the best tags every single year. Not that I have a problem with that, but don't go and comparing yourself to that. Don't think that that's attainable because it's not. Not every one of my hunts is a trophy hunt. Not every, you know, you just got to take everything with a grain of salt and you got to figure out your niche and use social media to motivate you. Get competitive. Like competition is what drives us as human beings. It's not a bad thing to feel like, oh shit, he did that on public land. I want to go do that. That's not a bad thing. Yeah, no. And and that uh, uh, the, the one the way I look at it, at least, is like, you know, I'll see people that are hunting your whitetail, elk, mule deer on places that are are arguably a lot better than where I where I'm hunting them most of the time. Okay? <laughs> yeah. And it's like, I don't discount them at all. Like, I don't look at them and it's like, oh, you know, it must be nice or do anything like that. Like, that's awesome. But I'm also not going to compare myself to them as far as what what I'm able to to have an opportunity at or, 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 you know, be able yep. to do. And I think that's just like, cause it can get, it can get, you know, if you're, if you're having a, a bad season or whatever, having yeah. a trouble on your hunt, it's so hard when like, I remember I was elk hunting there and I got service for a little bit and I'm like on day nine or whatever and had missed a bull and like all this stuff. And then, then all of a sudden I look <laughs> and it's like, everybody's killing bulls and i'm like you kidding, gotta yeah. be kidding me no I, w- I was happy for him obviously but you get that thing in your head you're like yeah, what yeah. the heck no you yeah, like why why do i yeah, suck so the- bad and but you, what, yep. one thing you said earlier that i really liked and this is how i compare it is like when you talked about something that motivates you enough to go it and you know to really go all in and you know go through all the ups and downs think about it, it's like all right you find that buck, that bull, or whatever it is that you want to chase. Doesn't matter how big he is, but to you, if it's like this is your thing that you want to hunt, it's like filling up a, um, a three liter platypus bag versus a Nalgene bottle and just dripping the motivation out through it because you're just gonna run through it. It's yeah. like, all right, you got you got yeah. more in the tank. <laughs> you gotta, yeah, you gotta figure out. You gotta figure something out because trophy or selective hunting, whatever you want to call it. To me, it's the same thing. Um, that's going to drain your tank. It drains my tank every year. By the time the hunt ends here on the Wasatch front, I am so ready for it to be done. And then, you know, four weeks right later, I'm ready to go to Arizona, right? Cause it's a different change of pace down there. And I get to go hunt with good friends down there. But by the time the, the, the hunt ends on the front, I put it all out there. I've done I've, I've done everything I could possibly do. And, and I'm, I'm so relieved when the hunt ends because I've just put it all out there. And I think, honestly, I think that's what it takes, um, in this particular area. Um, just that, that obsessive compulsive type, uh, just war of attrition. Um, I think that there's a lot to be said for, uh, just putting your head down and going to work every day. Um, trying not to be distracted by others using it as motivation. Um, and I, and again, I don't, I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, I don't think comparison is bad. I mean, I think that it can be bad, but if it, if it motivates you and shows you what's possible, then, I mean, before, before, um, before, I mean, score, score, score in and of itself is for comparison, right? What What's the purpose of score? It's comparison. It's it, the Boone and Crockett, uh, Pope and Young. That's all comparison that you're comparing yourself to your peers before I got really, so I've rifle hunted my whole life since I was a kid, you know, very young fished hunt. Well, teenager in, in, in my twenties, uh, for 10, 15 years, I was a very competitive rock climber, traveled the world that met my wife climbing. Um, 
And same thing, like climbs are, are graded um, on the Yosemite decimal system. And, and, and uh, though you're not climbing, you know, you're not competing, maybe on the Wasatch because <laughs> it's Mortal Kombat hunting, you're competing against other hunters, but typically hunting isn't competing against others. But, but you kind of are, if you're chasing a score, that's comparison. Same with climbing. The, the two are the same. You're not climbing unless you're speed climbing and the X games or something. You're not climbing against somebody else, but you're climbing against a particular grade that you want to achieve, but somebody else set that grade. So you really, you, you, you are, it's still a competitive sport because you're trying to attain and, and same with hunting, especially selective and trophy hunting. Uh, for the most part, you're not, I guess there's that show that's like hunt wars or something that, that maybe is direct yeah. competition. But anyway, you get what I'm saying. It's not, it's competitive in the fact that you're shooting for a score that's being judged on or it has been developed from your peers. So competition is good. It, it can serve as a motivation, show you what's possible. As soon as that starts to like degrade you, which it does for every one of us, that's kind of when you got to, you got to turn it off. Um, and then you got to realize that social media is, is, is the highlight reel for everyone. And I, I, I get it just the other day at the Easton, the guy made the comment thinking that I have like endless time. Well, no, dude, I don't <laughs> have endless time. Uh, so the one thing that my, my friend and I joke that, so for whatever reason, I'm just really unlucky and I end up having to put a, a lot of effort in on my hunts. And if, if, if God could like watermark an effort meter on every, you know what I mean? I I'd be interested to see that. Not that it means two shits. Cause I, I, I got lucky on, on that three by four I was telling you about where I killed him second day of the hunt, like not a ton of effort went into that hunt, but like other hunts, like it could be cool if there was like a watermark and I would respect that, man. If I, if I, if I came across Instagram and I saw this watermark and, and, uh, and, and some dude had like 140 inch three point or, or four, five, I don't care. You know, some maybe average buck, but the watermark was just pegged, dude, I would, I'd get on there and I'd comment the hell out of it. Cause that at the end of the day, like I like to see people, uh, putting themselves out there doing better, um, and, and, and accomplishing goals and wading through the muck to, to find success. Cause that's just like, that's the American dream, yeah. right? Like we wade through the muck and to find success. And that's why I think OTC, I don't know what I'm going to do when I finally draw like a really good limited <laughs> tag. I'm probably going to like pass out or die of a heart attack because I'm not going to know what to do. Like, I'm not going to know, I'm, I'm going to have so much pressure on myself. Like, Oh my word, I've drawn my first, literally I've applied for every <laughs> Western major Western <laughs> state for 10 years and I can't draw <sighs> a limited tag to save my life. But, but anyway, and, and, and I would like to know, maybe maybe you buy maybe you buy a ranch tag but maybe it's a hard fucking hunt and and your water meter's pegged i don't care if it's a ranch hunt like if if you have to freaking work your ass off to kill that animal great yeah like it doesn't matter like i just want to see people work hard to obtain their goals the the thing that hurts me the most especially on the front is there's been a couple of instances where a couple of bucks that I've been aware of and a couple that I've chased have been killed by guys. There's like, you know, that was my first time up hunting the front this year. And I was just like, Oh yeah, <laughs> it's like November. And I'm like, I'm like, my eyes are like my, I just haven't slept eight hours in like four months. And, and my eyes are like falling out and you killed the first, first, first day. Uh, uh, when you say first, first day, uh, just first day this week or is that for, no, for first day. Yeah. I actually just moved here from North Carolina and this guy recommended this trail and I came up here and he was chasing a doe across the trail. This is a true yeah, story. I figured it was. <laughs> and I'm just like, Oh, it's a buck I called forklift. 
And then another buck I called King Crab died by some out of state guy who actually was camped on the mountain and knew how to kill deer. So, but, but yeah, I mean, those are the ones that I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, my, the yeah, most like, painful, but funny meme that I've seen on Instagram is it's, it's really, it's pushed right at Pennsylvania hunters, but it's like, it's like, you've been chasing this buck all season and this guy is going to shoot it on the first day, a rifle sitting on an open power line or whatever. And it's just like, it's Dwight from the office, like smoking a cigarette, like, you know, just sitting there. It's just like, yep, yep. yeah, that's, that's, that's what happens. But what, well, you know, I, and people are probably tired of me saying this, but it's so true is I talk to so many really, you know, successful hunters, you know, across the country and everywhere. And it's like, everybody has there's one thing that everybody does and that's just grind until the absolute end and you know like you know like talking to you and you know reminds me of like tony treach who's become a, a good friend of mine and and tony's gonna be pumped that you know i'm doing some more western hunting podcasts he he was just bitching at me the other day saying that i was doing too much whitetail yeah. stuff but he uh he he um you know i remember and i was uh, personally kind of invested in this one because I was, you know, texting him and I was hunting the same area before and he was coming in and he's like, I'm going to find this elk that I found last year and I'm going to hunt him." And, and he spent days and days and he found them. And he's like, I'm just like, you know, I had no idea if he was even still alive, but he was focused on finding this bull. And then like, you know, he'd text me at night and be like, oh, he wasn't in a stockable position. You know, he was just waiting, waiting, waiting. Yep. The next thing you know, I'm getting a picture of this giant bull that, you know, shouldn't have come out of this area. Like, and I'm like, you know, that's just, and it, it doesn't, it doesn't just happen once to him, you know, and, and happen to guys like you, like yep. it happens over and over again. it's like, that's just, that's the definition of some hard work and dedication that goes into it to, to be able to, to make those things happen. And, and man, that motivates me seeing other people do that and, you know, continually do that to, for me to be become better you know like when you look you know even you know you yeah. mentioned a competition standpoint i even look at it like i put you know you guys on like a pedestal of like okay i want to i want to do that like i want to be like that but you can't mine mine's a little mine's a little shorter <laughs> so i don't i don't know if i put me on a pedestal maybe i need to be on a taller pedestal because i'm yeah. short so i'm still shorter than the rest <laughs> but my pedestal's taller. Anyway, you're going off a total height. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll go with that, <laughs> but no, you're, but, but it's so true. Like, I don't know. I, I use that as motivation, you know, and I look at it like I've been lucky enough to have like my dad that I've seen on the whitetail side. That's been shooting nice bucks every single year since I was a kid. Like never it just seems like he's always doing it. And it's like, but he's still outworking me, you know, two to three times of what, what I'm able to do. And it's just like that, that motivates me to, you know, continually, you know, do better and, and get better at these things. So I don't know. I love it. Yeah. I think that sometimes we want to shy away from that competition is a real thing and comparison isn't good and it, it's good. It, what's what, it's what drives human society. Um, you just got to keep that stuff in check and, and you got to be realistic. Again, you're not, don't go comparing, don't go comparing yourself. I won't name names, but there's plenty of guys out there who, you know, and they've worked their asses off to get to a point in their life where they can buy those great tags every year. But if you're a general, general season, you know, general season OTC type hunter, you, you, you can't set your goal on, you know, killing a, you know, it's, it's just unrealistic to set your goal that you're going to kill a 200 incher on your, your, like, like, for example, you're going to South yeah. Dakota. You're, I know that that's a really target rich environment. I've had a couple of buddies do that hunt and they love it, but unless something fluky happens, you're probably not going to see many bucks over 165, even one, you know, 175, 170, 165, but you're going to see a whole lot of bucks in that 130 to 150 class range. Um, so you just, you got to know what you're getting into. You got to, it's great. It's great training grounds. I'd, I'd, if I had the time at the end, like going to South Dakota in November and just having fun and stocking bucks, like I'm all for yeah. it. You just got to know what you're getting into. Right. And then when you draw that coveted tag, hopefully you've got some experience under your belt, stocking deer, killing deer. You can't go in my mind 
Some people may disagree. You can't go from zero to hero. You can't go from zero to hero. Totally agree. You can't go from you're never, you've never killed anything to all of a sudden you're expecting to kill 200 inch deer around every tree because what's going to happen when you draw back on that 200 inch buck and you realize, oh shit, I get really bad buck fever or there's just so many things that can go. I, I get a big kick. My buddies get, my buddies and I get a big kick out of this term. Like I, I passed on that buck. I passed on that buck. Well, what does that mean? Like I've literally had, I've, I, I've literally missed like, I've literally had opportunities where I thought that this 180 inch buck, like multiple, I'm saying like probably more than ten, like maybe not more than 10, but definitely more than five. So between five and 10 opportunities on 180 inch type bucks or better where something happened when I was inside bow range and or drawing my bow and even arrow release and I still didn't kill him. So how in the hell are you saying that you passed on a particular animal when I've shot arrows at 185 inch deer and didn't kill him? Like, a stick that you didn't see comes out of nowhere and just says F you and blocks your (laughs) arrow or the buck's not even aware of you. And he's got his head up a doe's butt and somehow doesn't react to your arrow, but decides to like take an extra step or something. I mean, this, I mean, so I just get a kick out of that term. Like, Oh yeah, I could have killed him. I passed on him. I'm like, Oh, well, shit happens right up until you draw double long blood and <laughs> and then yeah it just happens i mean and sometimes uh i haven't talked much about it but i i hit a pretty good buck on the front not giant but uh last year thought he was dead to rights got lung blood didn't find him i spent the rest of the hunt uh looking for the deer i it was uh i was looking for one deer in particular couldn't find him and then i told myself after thanksgiving um, it's probably something worth, worth saying. I hunted this particular deer all season, found him scouting early on doing the macro glassing thing, um, z- zoned in, um, little bit of pressure on the opener. The deer vanished and couldn't, didn't find him, didn't find him, didn't find him, hunted, took a pause on that, hunted out of state, regrouped, came back in November, searched my guts out for him. Couldn't find him. Couldn't find him. I told myself after Thanksgiving day. If I have not found the deer, I'm going to go, I'm going to go buck hunting, yep. if you will. Still with a high, still being pretty selective, but so I found this buck, I uh, decided to stalk him, almost got a shot off the first day, second day in, uh, uh, hit him really good, lung blood. Um, and, uh, I don't, I don't know what happened. I, he kicked as, so my arrow hit like right behind his shoulder. Um, I had a guy that was, uh, watching through the spotter. He saw it as well at the same time that like he was kicking. So I think what happened is his shoulder, his near side shoulder pushed the, the arrow, the back of the arrow back, forcing the front of the arrow forward in the body cavity. So I don't know how, cause it was broadside but I know I only got one lung. Oh, okay. So something had to happen with that arrow um, to force it forward. Well, it just so happens that I distinctly remember, and the guy who was spotting for me remembers as well, that you saw the impact right behind the shoulder. You saw him kicking, and then you saw my arrow break. Like, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't brush it off on anything. And I've, I've seen this plenty of times before, um, on deer and elk where, well, they'll break at when that, when that, when that near side leg comes back, that scapula will come back and break that arrow off. Well, that happened, I think, as my arrow was going in. And so I think he drove it first. So I caught, I know I got one lung on a broadside shot right behind the shoulder. And that's just me trying to figure out why I only got yeah. one lung on that shot situation. And I spent, so Thanksgiving well, 24th last year, the hunt closed the end of November. So I spent the next seven days looking for that buck. Um, ne- never, never found him. Looked for birds for another two weeks. And 
Uh, I know he's dead because this particular area is in a spot that I can glass repetitively and buddies of mine can, and he's just never turned back up on the winter range. So, Oh man. But yeah, so that, I mean, that's just, that's just part of, part of hunting. And I, you know, I definitely think that, you know, I'm, I'm not the, I'm not the draw blood ethics police. You know, I think that once hunters have done their due diligence, I think, I think they have, I think they have maybe you can, you can X this out of the podcast if you don't want me saying it. But I, I, I feel that if, if, if you've done your due diligence and that's going to be different for every person that you've got a right to, to get back in the saddle and start hunting again. Um, I'm not saying that, you do that time and time again, you know, if that happens a second time, you're probably should be done. But, you know, I shit happens bow hunting. And I'm just not the type that if, if you put in your due diligence that you can't get back in the saddle for me, I hit that buck at the end of the hunt. I I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to hunt anything else at that point. But if that would have happened a month earlier, would I've gotten back in the saddle? Yeah. I'd like to think I would. And I just don't think that. Yeah that draw blood, um, it shit, shit happens. And I, and I don't think, and, and the game and fish departments, they take that stuff into account now. And again, if, you know, you, if you've wounded two bucks, yeah, then I'd, I'd start. But yeah, what, what's your thought on that? I'd be curious what, what you think. No, I, I honestly, I, I'm in complete agreement with you on it. And like, and the the way I look at it is like, and when, like you said, putting your due diligence in is that's not just like, okay, I lost blood. I, I'm done, you know, like sort of deal. This yeah. is, I'm talking yeah. like, you know, so I, I showed it in that uh, elk film that when this comes out, it'll just the film when it just came out where that bull, I got in 18 yards, I hit him and I, I nicked a branch went right into his back strap on film. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, you know, I looked for him knowing that it probably wasn't lethal, but I was like, never know. So I just, you know, did my due diligence, ended up finding him again and he was alive and fine. But even, even, you know, if it wasn't that case, I, after of putting in all my effort to do everything I can to find that bull buck, whatever it is, I would still hunt. That's, that's, that's the way I look at it. I know some people don't agree with that, but that's the way I look at it because shit does happen. And, you know, it's like, I know I'm going to get absolutely railed as far as from people when they see the, see a video. It's like, Oh, you know, cause I'd missed a bull earlier in the hunt and then, you know, wounded. And it's like, I own that, like completely understand that's, that's on me, but that happens and it does happen to bow hunters. And it's like, okay, what can you do to, to improve on it? And I think it's also important to show that, that things can happen poorly sometimes and, and yep. analyze that situation. Don't, you know, don't beat yourself up to the point where you never bow hunt again, but like figure it out and, and, yeah. and work towards it, move you on. know, and move towards it. Yeah. And so that, that's the thing that I was kind of trying to highlight with this, um, with, uh, this, uh, uh, this passing, you know, this passing idea, I hit a buck, 170, 175 inch three by four, behind the shoulder broadside and i and i didn't get him H- how does that even happen like you know what i mean like there's just so much crap that can happen it would be it would it just wouldn't be fair if you were penalized for something that was completely out of your control i made a perfect shot it 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 just was a very bad circumstance where the deer was probably reacting to the sound of my 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 bow or my arrow and that front shoulder was coming back as my arrow was, was entering and it, it it is what it is. So that, that's the whole, that's the whole, like, I just have, I, I, my buddies and I make fun of guys who were just like, Oh, I passed on that buck. I passed on that buck. And they'll, they'll even show like footage, like they'll show footage and they'll show like, a deer or elk behind like this giant bush and like, Oh, I passed on it. Like, yeah, yeah, you passed <laughs> on it. You're within 40 yards. Sure. But you're never going to get a shot opportunity in that stuff. Like, and then even if you do get an arrow off, I've had like, call I'd be, I had this whole room down here. I get, I've got three spots upstairs for mounts in our living room and then everything else gets crowned down here. And every few years I have to 
start cutting the antlers off and sell them because I, I, this is the spot I got and it fills up and keep the good ones. And anyway, but if passing on bucks meant killing bucks, this room would be full of giants. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I do kind of, I laugh at that too. Like, cause it's, you know, I, I do think sometimes people call passing anytime they see a deer too. It's like, you know, it's yeah. like, oh, yeah, passed on them. You know, it's like, yeah, that's, that's, that's all. Yeah. I chose not, I chose not to stalk, yeah. but to, 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 to insinuate that, oh, that buck was dead to rights. That buck last year was more dead to rights than I could ever even possibly imagine with that shot placement, the distance, like the setup. And I have no grip and grin. Like, yeah, it's what it is. Well, well, there was, um, there's a situation last year when I was in West Virginia that when I was telling you, I was down there for those four days, the last day I, um, so where I hunt in this coal mine country, so you can actually spot and stock almost like you would be with mule deer. And I was during mm-hmm. the rut and I found this buck and I was oh, like, cool. and, and looking at it and, and, you know, for me, I'd been super happy with it, but we were really trying to bow hunting only area. It's like these bucks can get really big. And, and we, yeah, we made the right. decision that we we're hunting this spot that, you know, weren't going to shoot anything unless he was 150 inches or bigger. And that's that for the guy from Pennsylvania, that was like unheard of, you know, and this buck. And I'm like, <laughs> he's probably yeah. about 145 inches, a four year old. And I'm like, you know, trying to, I'm like looking at him so much, you know, zooming in, uh, you know, I had my phone scope on there and I'm like zooming in on, I'm like trying to make him bigger than he was. And I'm like, well, I'm just going to get a closer look. So, you know, I put a stock in, he was, he was bed down with a doe and, you know, I got within like 50 or 60 yards of him. And it's like, I, I, I'd be careful how I tell that story. It's not like I passed on this deer because a lot can happen with that closing the distance yeah. and the shot and all that stuff. But I chose not to go any further and, you know, backed yeah. off of it, you know, but that's, it's, it's such a, that's such a good point because the, the term passing on it is like, yeah. How, how is that interpreted? Well, and it's, yeah, yeah. And it's just in, and a lot of times it's insinuated that, that, um, Oh, I could have killed that deer if I wanted to. Oh, I could have done. I, I, I don't know. Like, like, I don't know. It, it's just, I don't know if it's insecurity and in, in eating tag soup or or a conversation point I mean, too. I, like just the or like kind of keeping up with a story. Like, oh, you know, someone says like, oh, I I shot this. Well, yeah, I passed on one. You know, it's just like a, <laughs> yeah, yeah, an, an ego yeah, thing. Point, you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, an ego thing. I yeah. So I think that's. I think that's really funny. Um, I get a kick out of that. I get a kick out of that yeah. stuff. The uh, the uh, the one thing that I respect at it, um, you guys in the kind of the, some of those unorthodox methods out out in the east. Um, I know Tony does, you know, kind of more sp- kind of spot and stock with decoys on yeah. whitetails and stuff. And you were just talking about spot and stock um, in. Uh, West Virginia. Um, I got to imagine that, um, you know, the perception here in the West is that whitetails are, are pretty jumpy. Um, so I got to imagine that, um, although the terrain may not be quite as difficult, but the alertness and awareness of the deer is probably on a next level over mule deer. Would you agree to that? Yeah. I mean, I haven't hunted mule deer enough to really give a good, uh, understanding of, of that, but whitetails are definitely, definitely jumpy and in that sort of sort of way and they they can get boogered up you know pretty easily but you know it's it's funny you say that about the train though because and where where i hunt in west virginia is i no joke and i'll I'll show you pictures of it it's it's as steep as anywhere i've hunted out west just not it's just not at all you know there's like you know 1200 foot of elevation gain from top to bottom versus thousands of feet you know sort of deal yeah um and so it it is has some tougher terrain but for the most part it's it's you know definitely lacks terrain compared to hunting the rocky mountains and you're not dealing with elevation or altitude and all that you know different kind of stuff there but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'll be interested once when I hunt some mule deer just a little bit more and just kind of see their mannerisms compared to whitetails and if it's similar or not. But I can't really speak on that specifically. Yeah, yeah I just I, I I don't know. Maybe it's just my perception. I've not hunted whitetails very much, um, but from what I've seen, they, they they do seem 
quite that being said i mule deer in general it's kind of funny because here on the wasatch our deer see a lot of human pressure and um they are extremely jumpy um they're just so pressured they've been hunted uh, they've been stalked so many times they see a lot of humans um compared to like where i hunt in colorado you can get away with so much i'm not saying that colorado guys have it easy but what i can get away with in utah versus what i can get away with in colorado is night and day and i was actually just talking to brody my good friend at western hunter about this that here on the front literally i've got like so i'll go i'll wake up i wake up when i scout at about 3 30 to 3 45 in the morning and i go up and I'll gain 3,000, you know, two to 3,000, maybe sometimes, depending on where I'm at, up to 4,000 feet of elevation. For that, I have to get up a little earlier. And it'll be all, it'll be for like literally like the first 40 minutes of light. And then it's back down to work. And the crazy thing is, is how fast bucks will bed here on the front in the middle of the summer. And I go to, to, Colorado on the muzzleloader hunt and they've been bow hunted and they still feed out till 10 in the morning. And I'm just like, Oh my, <laughs> yeah. it's just, it's just crazy. Like it, it's, it's just crazy. And then some stuff that I've gotten away with. I mean, I've killed, uh, I've killed a nut. We've killed a number of bucks, uh, set bucks and bulls, uh, uh, on this muzzleloader hunt that we've been doing in Colorado. And, half of them have been within bow range that would have, you know, barring some, you know, it's a slower trajectory, barring anything like that. The, the animals could have been killed with an arrow just based on the distance. And, uh, it's just crazy. What it's just crazy. The difference you can get away with, um, there. Um, and this is an extremely remote area We're we're packed in on horses or llamas, a stupid number of miles, you know, 15 to 22 miles. And, but, um, anyway. yeah. So I, I, I really wonder if the whitetails kind of behave more like just in general behave more like the deer that I'm used to on the Wasatch front than say, you know, the, um, uh, the, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. No. And, and I think, I think that's also like different areas like i've i've never been to texas hunting but i've heard that the deer there because everyone's always hunting them over feeders that like you go to shoot and if you're over you know 20 30 yards sometimes they can drop like a foot and a half you know by the time your arrow gets there where i'm not we're not dealing with that at least you know where where i hunt typically but you know they can be a little bit more skittish or looking up especially if they know where tree stands are they've been hunted you know they start doing some of that that kind of stuff which is wild but it's very situational you'll have you have deer that have been educated to stand so that they will look yeah looking for human beings and trees yeah especially if they've been spooked spooked out a bit like I, yeah, especially if they've been spooked out of it. I, I think it's like, uh, I, I know, especially like in farm country and stuff, if they're coming out in sp- uh, certain spots and fields or whatever, and someone's got a ladder stand there that they're always in. I, I learned that when I was hunting, uh, uh, when I was in college and I was hunting a bunch of ag ground and it would be like, you'd hunt these same spots. And, but I remember looking across this field and this doe came out and had looked in this corner where their guy had a tree stand, like looked up before, you know, she came out into the field. And it was just like, (laughs) that. it's mostly the does. It's it's mostly the does. They're smarter than the bucks, in my opinion, for like a lot of the times, like, cause the bucks, what the bucks will do is like send the does out first. So if they get out and they, they get up and ski, then they can kind of follow along, especially if they're going to feed, but it's funny. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's crazy. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't realize that we, it's funny how you play off of different, you know, different things like that in different seasons. Um, you know, obviously hunting, hunting the right, you're hunting the does. Um, and then, and everyone thinks that the, the rut is just this magnificent time to hunt. And it is cause it brings the big dogs out, but man, it's so frustrating when they get all, all, all piled in together and, and they're just way less predictable. Um, but, but those does do bring the big bucks out. It's just, it's just another, it's just another animal. You gotta, 
learn and you got to grow and you got to move with it. The biggest thing for me that I've noticed just changing your tactic for the situation is, is especially if, so if you're, if you're still hunting mountains during the rut, I think that's a little different, but if they've come down into the foothills and you've got more of a prevailing, so in the mountains, you don't have prevailing winds so much as thermals, you know, if there's a major storm coming in, you may have a prevailing wind, but you're getting down to like flat country or rolling hills. You generally just have a prevailing wind. And I, I just start, I, I've, I learned a handful of years ago, four or five years ago, how much better I was doing hunting them, how I dog elk, but deer in the rut. And I've, I've, I've just been so much more successful with that tactic than, than, um, than anything else. And it, it, it makes sense. Right. Yeah. And it, it, uh, it's been productive for me. No. And so. it, it's, it's cool just to learn, you know, what works for you. And then like adapting to the situations, you know, the way I hunt white tails early on in the season is so much different than I hunt them during the rut. And then so much different than I hunt them during gun season. And then late season, yep. you know, like yeah. there's just, it's yep. completely different. You know, you're still hunting the same animal, but there there's different things that are going on and different tactics to, to be able to, to do that. And I don't know, I, I like, I like getting creative with it. Like that's where I've had so much fun in West Virginia because it was like a combination out West, you know, I'm doing some spot and stock or, you know, hunting from the ground and doing just different things mm -hmm. that are, you know, fun to, to be able to play around with and see what, you know, doing whatever it takes to, to figure out how to kill some of these deer. Yeah. Yeah. Thinking outside of the box. Yeah, definitely. 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 And if you want to keep drawing tags and, yeah, you may not be able to get those quintessential high country mule deer hunts every year, but you can get tags every year that are a little less quality and maybe require different tactics. And yeah, um, if you start, if you, if you grind on those and you do them enough, then you'll start figuring things out. And yeah, yeah. Yep. Well, cool. I, I love it, man. I mean, I p apologize for taking uh, two hours of your time out here, but I was having fun with that conversation. Yeah, no, I actually, where did, yeah, I guess I see the timer up there in the corner. I didn't even realize it was yeah. four hours, so. Yeah, we, uh, we it, goes, it goes by quick when you just start bullshit. <laughs> I know. No, it was, it, that was a really fun conversation, James. I mean, I appreciate you coming on and, and talking to me as, like I said, it was funny, you know, we just, you know, met in person for the first time a few days ago and I was like, love to have you on the podcast and it worked out like right away to be able to get the schedules lined up and, you know, to, to be able to do that. So thank you. I appreciate you coming on. Yes. Yeah. 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 Appreciate it. Um, thanks for the opportunity and yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's nice getting to meet you. Um, and, uh, just getting to chat. I had a lot of fun on this discussion and really hoping you, I, I, I love deer. Like I've got to kill it. Like my wife will literally tell me that if it gets, if it gets later into the season, and I haven't killed an elk. My wife will gently remind me that the elk is table fare and the deer is just jerky or whatever. <laughs> and, uh, so I'll get gently reminded that if I haven't killed an elk, I need to fill the freezer, but I'm really excited that you're, you're going to pursue, uh, the King of the West, which I view as mule deer, but that is, that's only recently, I'd say in the last six, six years or so changed for me. Cause before that for a period there, man, I just thought that elk were, and I still love elk. I love to eat elk. I love hunting elk in the rut. I just, I love elk too, but man, something about the places that mule deer take you and they're just, it's like this chess match with a big buck. And it's, it's this competition with a very intelligent animal that's 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 weary uh or wary and he they, they just their instincts are so are so intense um that i've literally had three deer now on the wasatch front that are basically just flat disappeared the one kk that appeared in in the rut right i mean if it wasn't for trail cameras Literally all my trail cameras did because he never hit like, he, I had like two trail cameras that he hit more than one time, but like I had 30, I ran 30 different trail camera spots. I had like 20 cameras that I circulated between 30 spots 
And in, in the number, in that number, he only hit two twice. So it was just unpatternable. Uh, so that deer basically, I didn't, I saw him with my own eyes years prior when he was younger, but that year that I killed him, I saw him like July 8th. And then I didn't see him again with my own eyes until November 18th, like 15th or 12th. I can't remember the exact date, but something like that. And then there's a buck that I called quad pod that a guy named Connor Rollins killed. Um, that buck flat disappeared until the rut. Same thing was visible all summer long. I know of, you know, plenty of heavy hitters on the Wasatch front myself, Ty Glenn, uh, Sean Morgan. I know Connor was after the buck. Lots of us were after this buck that year and he vanished and ghosted everybody until the rut brought him out. No, literally nobody saw him in between those dates. And then, um, a buck that I was personally chasing last year, uh, did the same thing after opening day, got a little bit of pressure and, um, disappeared. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's just crazy that they, that they can do that, that they, that their instincts drive them to do that. Um, and if you're hunting an animal that is that instinctual, that his habits force him to essentially, his habits make him be so reclusive. It's just matching wits with, I don't know. I think it's just, it's just like the ultimate chase game, matching wits with a deer that with an animal that can be that reclusive. I mean, evade that many hunters, evade trail cameras, evade, they're just incredible animals. And but so I'm really excited that you're going to kind of focus on mule deer and hope, wish you the best in South Dakota and try to use some of those. Obviously, I think in South Dakota, it's fairly open ter- terrain. So you'll probably be able to spot and stock. Um, you're not going to, if you do, oh, uh, you mentioned you probably won't go back for the rut, but. I, I like to tell a lot of people that in that rolling hill country, like I said, don't, don't, don't be afraid to hunt them more like elk at that point. Not calling, not so much calling, but just kind of dog in the herd type yeah. mentality. No, that, that makes total sense. I have, I have such a problem doing anything else in November other than hunting whitetails during the rut that it's just, yeah, your that's, thing. yeah, that's my thing. I'm, I am hunting sick of black tail deer October 29th and November 4th this year in Alaska. So like that, that, oh, that, cool. that was, that's like one of those things where it's like, I've been wanting to do it forever, but I've hated that it takes away from my favorite time to whitetail hunt. Yeah. But, uh, it, it, uh, I can't complain about that at all. Cause it'll be, it'll be amazing. No, no. So, and I, I'm, I'm the opposite. Like if I have not killed a deer on the front, a lot of people have asked me if I've ever been interested in going to, to go whitetail hunting. And, and honestly I would, um, I was talking to John Barco about this in, um, kind of when we were all kind of just there having fun shooting the shit. Um, a few years ago, five years ago now, I ended a hunt on a really shitty Arizona elk tag, but I'd never killed a bull in Arizona. And it it was the last state I needed to kill, except for Nevada. Nevada hates me and they only have draw (laughs) tags for elk. And, but I've killed a bull in every state surrounding Utah, including Utah, but Nevada and I needed to kill a bull in Arizona. So I put in for a crappy, pretty much draw it. If you put in for it, a tag, it's basically just cedar country, lots of trees. Anyway, the name of the game is sitting water and just hope that you get lucky. It was back when you could still use trail cameras in Arizona. So I placed a lot of trail cameras and for two weeks, it was, it was two week hunt over Thanksgiving. So my friend Jaron drove down with me and helped me set like 15 trail cameras. And then I drove him to the airport and he came home. And then I was like the next 12 days solo I did break for Thanksgiving, went to my in-laws house, came back. But basically for 12 days, I was solo sitting water and I killed, um, I, I killed a, a small five point, the last 10 minutes of legal shooting light of the last day <laughs> and wasn't a big bull, but a couple of things that bull, that bull did a lot for me. It, it, it secured that basically this desire of killing a bull in every state touching Utah. 
And then I killed three bulls with my bow that year in three different states, all general tag, pretty much general tag. That was a draw tag, but if you put in for it, you draw it. So that, that bull, he wasn't giant, but man, that bull meant a lot because it just accomplished a lot of goals for me. Three bulls in three states with a bow is something I'd, I've done two. I'd never done that. So I really want to do that. I, um, now, I, now I've got my eye set on killing like three nice six points in three states, but I've not yet to accomplish <laughs> that one. Yeah, that's it. The freaking animals like Corey Jacobson and um, uh, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't get mentioned a lot, but man, a guy that I just idolize is Nate Simmons. That guy yep. does the Western Hunter TV. I don't know. If, I, I mean, there's been multiple seasons where that guy will kill three bulls in th- uh, granted it's his job right so i again going back to that comparison thing um you know he's doing that for a living but holy hell three three mature six points in three states and filling in you know some some archery deer hunts as well oh, yeah. that's yeah so i that's I, I i'd really love to do that um and i'm not tied to the archery only um on that uh like i said i I've had my butt kicked so much on rifle hunts that yeah, you'd rather you know, I, hunt at it, that point. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, exactly. Like give me, give me the rut and yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so I've got, um, trying, trying to do it this year. I got three elk tags, um, two archery and, uh, um, uh, two archery and one muzzle loader. So try to see if we can do that this year. Um, that's always, that's a, I don't know if it's a goal, but it's always like in the back of my mind, man, if I could do this, that would be yeah. awesome. But I, I don't know, probably won't happen. Well, no, but, man, I wish yeah, you luck what with else? that. That's uh that, that, I mean, that sounds like it's exciting. I mean, to even have three elk tags now with like trying to get tags is not simple to be able to do. And, you know, yeah, yeah. I, uh, so Idaho, you can, you know, you can always do that. The, o, uh, the OTC option there. Utah has really shitty OTC tags, probably the worst OTC tag in the country, but it's a tag. And fortunately I'm here, so I, I can learn it a little bit more than, you know, you can play your cards right in Colorado and pick up a tag pretty easy. Um, they're there. There's opportunities there. They're just not highly desirable tags and they just take time. And fortunately for me in Utah, time's on my side with my job that I can hunt in the mornings. Um, but I was going to ask you, uh, well, what else? So you said you had South Dakota, um, the Sitka blacktail. Do you got an elk hunt lined up this year? Or? Um, so I did, I drew a Idaho elk tag. It was, I mean, it was over the counter, but I got, I got in and, but I ended up turning that tag back in. So I'm actually going to Alaska oh, okay. to hunt moose in September, which is an absolute oh, dream. You'd actually, you, yeah, you mentioned yeah. that. So I'm getting dropped off and just a DIY hunt, lake hunt, getting dropped off. And I'm going to spend the whole season in there with a good buddy of mine and my camera guy, Justin, to just, yeah, go go for it, man. So I'm I'm taking a rifle so how, and he's so taking how, a bow. Okay. So how, how, does that, how does that work? Is that like an – do you just buy a moose tag or did you have to draw it? No, or? you just buy a moose tag. The hardest part is getting a transporter – to fly in because they're so backed up and i got lucky that the mm. guy i'm going with ethan he had flown with this transporter in like 2018 and they only take repeat clients because they're so booked up and oh. so he got in and invited me so i got so i got to oh. go as a you know plus one essentially to to be able that's, to go do that bad. hunt so you so so you can just go buy a moose tag as long as you have a transporter so that's a fairly economical hunt. I mean, that you're not paying your, your, I mean, you got the transport fee, but you're not paying outfitter fees. You, you're, you haven't waited years to draw that tag. That's rad. I've heard of a lot of people doing that with caribou. Yeah. And that's been something that I really wanted to do. I didn't know that there was such a thing as doing that for moose. Yeah. It's the hard, like I said, the hardest part is getting in with the transporter because they're always so backed up. So it's almost like drawing a tag from that standpoint and, uh, to, to be able to do it. But I did the caribou, I did the caribou hunt in 2020 and I was like, man, I need to go back to Alaska. It's so amazing. So I've been, you know, working at it and I wasn't planning on doing two hunts there this year. I had the blacktail hunt 
booked it's same same thing it's like i have a charter so i'll be on a boat but they just drop you off every day and you come back and sleep on the boat and um had that book for a couple years and the moose hunt came up and i was like holy crap how am i gonna make this work but i was like i'm gonna figure it out because i've always wanted to do that so yeah i got so the big yeah so the moose hunt and then the south dakota deer and then i go back to to kodiak there so it's it's and then white tail sprinkled in in between there but yeah, which has me worried because I got yeah. you know all that time I'm going to be and I'm I'm not complaining for anybody listening, believe me. But as all all this time I'm going to be spending everywhere else, it's like for me to kill a good whitetail in Pennsylvania, I need to put, like it's like with you at the front, it's like I need yeah. to put a lot of time in. Like yeah. that's it gives me yeah. stressed out. It's like all right, I gotta figure yeah. out how I'm gonna how I'm gonna do that. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I know I know that feeling all too well. I try not to. I try not to to spread myself too thin and, and, and pretty much every year I do, but, <laughs> <Same>. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but, but yeah, I, it's just, it's, it's, I, I'm probably only going to make one trip out to Colorado this year. Uh, so I got a deer and elk tag. So probably going to go for 12 days and just, just call it good after that. Um, so try to combo hunt that. Uh, I'll make probably three trips up to Idaho, two different early trips for elk, and then rifle, rifle deer, they're in different units. So those couldn't even overlap. And then Utah, I just sprinkle those in, um, obviously focused deer on early September deer hunting sucks here. Um, uh, and then focus out of state, um, October kind of hunt some elk, uh, deer can actually start to be good again in October on the front where it's archery only. And then obviously November, dedicated to deer like you were saying with whitetail like you can't think of if i haven't killed a deer early oh i could not imagine hunting anything else but deer on the front in november if i hadn't already filled my tag um and that's the beauty of the arizona hunt is is you can tack that one on in january after christmas and your wife loves you again so she'll let you go get her something nice for christmas and it's like all right yeah get her something nice for christmas yeah this year we're going to hawaii i've never been to hawaii but i've heard it's great and my wife loves it so we're going to hawaii in february so i'm hoping that i'm hoping that between a good christmas and a and a trip to hawaii that i'll that i I should be golden for that that jane because it's always dicey by the end of november it's like i can sense that the 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 animosity or the yeah, a little bit. And then we have a nice December and, and then I'm like, Hey, so there's this January hunt. Oh, you, oh, that hunt that you do every year in January. Oh yeah. That one. Uh, so what do you think? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she's like, yeah, I know you're going to do it. So <laughs> yeah. Uh. Well, this year when Jaron and I did it, so I've done that three or four times, four, four or five times. One time I went down they actually came down. We were staying our, with in-laws in the central region of Arizona, and it. Uh, we got down there. Uh, just got to the in-laws' house where my wife's parents live in Sholo, and then I was gonna turn around and leave. But like we all started not feeling very good, and I was like, oh, maybe we ate something. Anyway, it turned into like this gnarly flu. So for a week, I, I tried to go and came back, and I was just like barfing, and so for like eight days, we just like just like lived in our in-laws house, which is not a very big yeah. house. And we just like, were sick. So that sucked. Then another time I killed a, a three by three down there, not near as nice as this one. Um, kind of the same visiting the in-laws. And then Jaron and I went down in 2022 where I killed that guy right there. I guess my camera. And uh, that was like, that was like, like a Rocky mountain type hunt where it was like, we're going for, we're, we're leaving Thursday night and we're coming back the following Sunday. Like this is a bunch of time dedicated, no (laughs) in-laws. And so that was, that was a treat. And then this last year it was, it was five days, kind of like an extended weekend type thing. Fly down. It was literally like fly down after work one night, get there at 11. Brody picks me up, hit the grocery store to pick up some water, a little bit of food. We're hunting glassing that next morning, hunt five days, and then take the first flight back to Salt Lake um, after the, the five days. 
Um, and I really liked how that was because it's normally like a 15 hour drive to get, I mean, we're really far South. So, um, so that's, that's really fun. That, that hunt is fun. It's so hard though, because there's days that you don't see a deer and when you get multiple days like that, it's, it, it, it's tough. It's tough to stay motivated, especially on the front. I can do it because I know what I'm going after. Cause I've scouted them in Arizona. When you, when you go two or three days and you haven't seen a deer, you start questioning like, why the hell am I hunting like this deep desert? I could go up in the foothills and see a lot of yeah. deer. Bucks aren't going to be as big, but just give and take, yep. right? hundred so. percent. Well, cool, James. I, I want you to I want you to tell everybody before we go here just where where people can find some of your stuff. I know you have a really cool uh, bow build video series that you did for Western Hunters on their YouTube, I believe. Oh yeah, is that is that I, I might have just told everybody where it's at, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually appreciate you saying that because I wanted to um, uh, I wanted to say this, and maybe it was bad to say this at the two hour and 18 minute mark. Cause maybe people aren't going to make through this, but yeah. So, uh, r- right now we, um, so right now we're running a big, uh, uh, bow giveaway on, um, our Western hunter platform. So, um, I went down and set up Brody's bow, but it was kind of more from an educational standpoint. And we made videos about how I set up bow, uh, how I, I've written a ton about it, but this time we wanted to do a video format. So we have four really in-depth archery videos on the Western Hunter YouTube. And to help get word out about this, uh, we partnered with Hoyt, Hamsky, Spot Hog, Easton, Iron Will. We've got like the $6,000 My Ideal Archery Setup. Um, uh, you know, it, a Hoyt Carbon Boat, just top of the line everything. And, uh, so that's, that's the giveaway. It's free. You have to enter your email and you got to follow me and Western Hunter, but criteria is pretty easy. I'm Yates underscore in underscore the underscore backcountry on Instagram or Western Hunter magazine. You can see the giveaway there. There's a landing page. It's got a link to the YouTube videos. They're really in depth. Um, uh, they're highly educational. So if you've ever thought about setting up a bow yourself or you're looking for, for tuning tips and tricks or peep tie in that sort of thing, it's all there. Um, it's the type of video that I think, you know, there's people like John Dudley who does a lot of stuff, but I don't think he quite goes into the detail that I go into here. And then, you know, bow shops don't want to go into that detail because that's their business. Right. So I think that's, it's in a position where, I just don't think there's much out there like it. It's this comprehensive building a bow from the ground up, extremely detailed, maybe overly detailed. There's probably three and a half hours in the four videos, but uh, ulti- the ultimate archery giveaway with it, um, we'll probably run that through most of August, I would think. When, when do you think you'll post the podcast? Yeah, it'll probably be middle of August. Okay. Yep. So... Uh, yeah. So that, that'll be running still probably at that time. And then the videos are obviously in YouTube and they'll be there forever. Um, I write for Western Hunter, the archery column. Uh, so pretty much every issue I've got something archery related in there, a lot of preparation stuff, uh, hunting tactics, and then I'm fairly active on Instagram, um, in posting content. I am really busy. So I, I'm not, always the most prompt at getting back on dms i do eventually work through them um so uh but i do try to put a lot of content on bow related content on instagram yeah so. definitely recommend checking those out and and uh on the week before this uh eric jackson will be on would have been on the podcast and he talked about this the video series there too so you can yeah. you can find it and uh, yeah he, you've helped out a lot of people through the writing and and Thanks. from what I, I haven't watched the bow build series yet but from what i've heard very informative and you know as eric said he's like get yourself a beer or whiskey and uh you know just go through it and just you know, take it all in but <laughs> yeah. yeah they're 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 long but they're 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 in depth they're everything you need to know it's a resource that if i if i had 
right when I first decided I was done with shops, man, it would have saved a lot of heartache. So that's what I'm trying to do. Help guys get up the learning curve uh, so they don't get stuck, kind of stuck in the proverbial rut and, and uh, so that they can, yep, just plow through it and do it all, do it, do it on your own and do it to the best of your ability. And I think you're, I think everyone should have a moderate understanding of how to tune their bow, honestly, because you go to a shop and they can only take you so far. It's not them shooting the bow, right? Like your paper tune will change. Your, your bear shaft tune will change. Your third axis changes depending on how you grip the bow. So especially if, if you're even dream, thinking about putting a fixed blade broadhead on your, on your arrow, you got to know some basic tuning. Yep. No, most definitely. Well, cool. So, All right, buddy. Well, thank you again for, for coming on. Yeah. And, and uh, I think what we'll do with this, anyone that's listening, I think I'm going to split this one in the two episodes, two parts and break it down. We did a lot of archery, you know, related stuff at the beginning and then mule deer kind of towards the end segment it just to make yeah. it easier. I know for me, like when they're like, and I've been breaking them up recently, whenever they go about two hours long, I always break them up in the two parts and then they're a little bit easier yeah. digest to, to digest, especially with, uh, information heavy stuff. So check out both of these episodes here and all the stuff James, you know, talked about here, but yeah, man, thank you so much. Yeah, Bo, it was a pleasure. I, I, I really enjoyed talking with you and like, like, love what you're doing. And I, your, your intention just seems so pure, like trying to help guys. Wow. I trying to help guys. Cause like I've had so much shit hit the fan. So a lot of my, a lot of my stuff just helps guys prepare. And I feel like you're genuinely trying to help guys do what you've done, what you love, go from East to West. And you know, you're, you're, you're just generally trying to help. So I, I, I relate to that and I say props to you and great work. No, I, I appreciate that because that's exactly it. I've been in everyone's shoes and I'm trying to, you know, continue to improve myself. So it's, it's just as much selfish wanting to learn as, you know, wanting to help people. But I figured if they can happen at the same time, that's good. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. And out here eventually, if I decide to ever give up in November, I'll, maybe I'll start pinging you with questions about hunting, hunting whitetails yeah. in November. So. <laughs> Sounds good, man. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.